those of you who have been sitting in these pews for a few years have probably figured out by now that I tend to steer clear of, of topical sermons. Truth be told, I harbor a deep prejudice against the genre. Too often a topical sermon is when the preacher picks a topic and then roots around in the Bible to find passages that will support what she or he has already decided to say. Sometimes the result is faithful to the witness of Scripture. Sometimes it's not. In many cases, the biblical text becomes more pretext than anything else. For the same reason, we tend around here to avoid special emphasis Sundays. If you follow the Presbyterian planning calendar, almost every Sunday would be a special emphasis Sunday. Did you know that today is Universal Day of Prayer for Students Sunday? Last week was a doubleheader. Health Awareness and Day of Prayer for Healing and Wholeness, and also Camps and Conferences Sunday. And February 3rd was, of course, Super Bowl of Caring Sunday, <laughs> as well as Chaplains Sunday. Pity the poor chaplains who had to compete with the Super Bowl. Once you start down that road, Sunday becomes less the Lord's Day and more whose agenda is up today. But as I say, today is the exception. Today the sermon topic is global climate change. I could take as my text a multitude of scriptural references, but let us just begin with the basics. Psalm 24, 1. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. Or if you prefer, as I do, the poetry of the King James, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and all who dwell therein. From a Christian perspective, this is where any discussion of climate change must start. The earth does not belong to us. It belongs to God and to God alone. When we humans speak of owning this or that plot of land, the, the coal beneath the mountain, the oil beneath the ocean, we are speaking theological nonsense. None of the creation belongs to us. Not oil, not coal, not water, everything belongs to God, just as every breath we take comes as a gift from God. Not only that, every creature belongs to God. The microorganisms we cannot see with the naked eye, the trees and the plants, the elephant and the ant, the snail darter and the snail, they belong to God as well. All creatures of our God and King, as the hymn of St. Francis said, or as we just sang, all creatures that have breath and motion, that throng the earth, the sea, the sky, come share with me my heart's devotion. Help me to sing God's praises high. You and I are not the owners of God's creation. We are the stewards of God's creation, entrusted to handle with care that which is not ours. Somewhere along the line, we Christians got our divine assignment muddled. We began to think of creation as something to be conquered, not nurtured. We mistook the mandate in Genesis to have dominion over the earth as a license to exploit the earth for our own purposes. Some historians think the problem began with the Enlightenment when we stopped thinking in communal terms and started to think in terms of each person being a rugged individualist. 
whatever the case, the real damage started with the Industrial Revolution. We dammed the mighty rivers to create electricity. We dug deep mines into the earth to find coal, and when that proved not profitable enough, we blew the tops off the mountains instead and used huge machines to take what we wanted. We even harnessed the power of the atom first to make bombs and then to power our factories and heat and cool our homes without regard to how we would cope with the resulting radioactive waste. We call this progress, the taming of nature, the victory of man over the elements. What we failed to notice was how the perceived benefits of all this activity came at a terrible cost to God's creation in the form of polluted rivers, toxic waste, the disruption of the ecosphere, and the extinction of entire species. We now know that the greatest and most dangerous consequence of our misuse of God's creation has come from the burning of fossil fuels. Expressed in simple terms, and I'm no scientist, I've got to keep it simple. We humans have put so much carbon into the atmosphere that we are causing the Earth's temperature to rise with alarming speed and devastating effect. Scientists call this the greenhouse effect. More than half of all the carbon humanity has put into the atmosphere in its entire history has been emitted in just the past three decades. 85% of it since the end of World War II. All that carbon is changing the Earth's climate. Seas are rising, droughts that used to go on for a year or so are lasting three and four years. The polar ice cap caps are melting. The glaciers are receding. Wildfires are consuming thousands more acres than in the past. What used to be a 500-year 500 500 flood is occurring in places like Houston, Texas, and as we Floridians know better than anyone else, shorelines are receding and hurricanes are becoming more powerful and indescribably destructive. The consensus among scientists is overwhelming and almost unanimous. Humanity is at a crossroads. If we do not reduce our consumption of fossil fuels and find a better and less destructive way to live together on this planet, we will soon doom our children and our grandchildren to a life of unspeakable misery on a planet that will be almost unrecognizable. In biblical terms, we are selling our birthright as stewards for a mess of pottage now. We are eating sour grapes and our children's children will have their teeth set on edge. We are robbing future generations of their rightful inheritance. We are treating as our own that which does not belong to us. It, as though, it is as though the prophet Jeremiah were speaking directly to us when he warns, Thus says the Lord, Cursed are those who trust in mere mortals and make mere flesh their strength, whose hearts turn away from the Lord. They shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when relief comes. They shall live in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land. Three short years ago, many of the world's leaders took an important step toward 
addressing the global climate crisis when they gathered in Paris and signed and committed to cut their greenhouse gas emissions. On December 12, 2015, leaders from 196 nations adopted the Paris Climate Accord and for that to take effect, 55 countries that produce 55% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions had to commit themselves to the agreement. Both China and the United States signed on, and on November 4, 2016, the agreement came into effect. And then came the election of 2016. On June 1st, 2017, President Trump declared his intention to withdraw from the Paris Climate Accord. That was not only a step in the wrong direction, it was proof positive that our current president cares nothing about the future of the planet. He chooses to ignore the true national crisis, indeed the global crisis, that is climate change. Instead, he prefers to spend billions to build a wall on our southern border. I have bad news for Mr. Trump. A wall cannot keep the planet from growing warmer. Whether immigrants or presidents, we all live at the same address. And we are all subject to the same laws of science. Acknowledged or not, climate change will scatter the proud in the imagination of their hearts. I am humbled and encouraged by the ways this congregation has behaved to repent and change the way we live our corporate life in the face of climate change. We were amongst the first congregations in the denomination to reduce our carbon footprint to zero. To accomplish this, we refurbished this historic sanctuary. We tore the roof off the education building and built a new roof that faces the sun properly. And on it put a solar voltaic display that produces about 25% of our electrical consumption. We yanked those old window units out of the windows and we installed many split heating and air conditioning units, highly efficient. And we're just now recycling all the copper pipe that used to be part of the ancient furnace system. But we didn't stop there. We approached the Presbyterian Foundation and asked them to help us withdraw our investments from fossil fuel companies and green up our endowment. We said we didn't think we should be supporting fossil fuel companies so long as they are committed to business as usual because it is business as usual that is the problem. For six years, we worked with fellow Presbyterians to convince the General Assembly to do the same. Three times we tried, three times we failed, and as we say now, the fourth try is a charm. <laughs> we are doing this because Jesus commands us to love God and our neighbors, and we are now coming to realize that neighbor love extends not just to those alive today, but also to those who will come after us. Neighbors not yet born, who will live with the consequences of our action or inaction. Some say all this concern is too little too late, and they might be right. But if the Church of Jesus Christ does not stand up and bear witness to the truth, how will the truth be known? How will the truth which sets us free be itself unbound in this age of greed and fake news and the overt denial of reality? Climate change is a moral issue.
No less than slavery was a moral issue for the ancestors who slaves built this sanctuary. No less than civil rights was a moral issue for some of you. Some of you who risk friendships and some of you jobs to work for racial justice. For now at least we cannot count on moral leadership from the highest levels of our government to think beyond the profits of the next quarter. We cannot expect the wolf to guard the hen house, but we can be the Church of Jesus Christ. We can be the called out people of God. We can live up to the example of saints who've gone before us and face similar moral challenges. Saints like Sojourner Truth and Martin Luther King Jr. Saints like C.K. Steele and R. Davis Thomas. And living saints too. Saints like Jim Antall and Bill McCubbin and Pamela McVitie. This congregation has made significant steps and we can do more and we will because we must. Most important of all, we must not give up hope. The God who calls us to work for climate justice is the same God revealed in Jesus Christ, whose grace sustains us in all endeavors to do God's will and whose steadfast love endures from generation to generation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.